Welcome to the journal.ie's The Explainer, where every week we take a deep dive into a different news story. I'm Sinead O'Carroll, and this week we are live and we are asking, what could Donald Trump's legacy be? Posing that question isn't our prediction. It's kind of a sneaky way of actually asking our guests to make a prediction, kind of. But if Donald Trump wins on Tuesday, his legacy will have started long before the 3rd of November. It'll actually have started long before 2016 even. But if he loses, well, what has his one-term presidency meant for America? His election was a jolt, something that looked like it had changed politics across the world forever. But if Joe Biden wins on Tuesday, someone who has been a quintessential Washington, D.C. politician for four decades, albeit a likable and liked one, does that mean Donald Trump, instead of actually draining the swamp, actually put the establishment on an even stronger footing than before? the swamp or the establishment or just good politicians working for their constituents, which is it? Is that an ideological question in itself? One that can only be examined if we look at America's current cultural war. How much of that was inevitable if we had Trump or if we didn't have Trump? How much of it was escalated by having the TV star in the White House? We're going to get to all of this, as well as the proliferation of misinformation about the candidates and have a look at where the current polling and voting is at right now. To do all that, and it is a mammoth task, we're aware we have brought in the best. So I'm delighted to be joined by the Journal.ie columnist and explainer veteran, Larry Donnelly, who is also a law professor at NUIG when the Irish media let him be, associate professor at Trinity College Dublin, Daniel Geary, who has a special interest in political ideologies and the intellectual and cultural history of America. So an absolutely perfect person for this candidate. And I'll let him plug his books that he has at, at the end of the podcast. And Shauna Davis, presenter and correspondent with Euronews, who is an expert in how misinformation and American politics have intertwined over the past four years. Thanks, everyone, for coming and joining us. Uh, I'm going to go around the houses on that kind of big question first. Uh, Larry, I'm going to start with you. What could Donald Trump's legacy be? Well, first, thanks, Sinead, for the invitation, and thanks to all the listeners for tuning in. Um, I, really, I, I, I'd, I'd stress three things in terms of Trump's legacy, and I think all of them, to an extent, are open questions uh, as we sit here and ponder them this evening. Um, the first is the future of the Republican Party. Uh, I think it needs to re be remembered that Donald Trump ran for the Republican nomination as something of an outsider. His positions on lots of issues, in particular uh, trade, uh, the role of the American military around the world, and indeed the role of the United States around the world, uh, are anathema to traditional conservatism. He won the Republican nomination for president, and now it appears that he enjoys the support of the vast majority uh, of the Republican grassroots. He has taken over the Republican Party. His philosophy has taken over the core of the Republican Party, no matter what um, the Lincoln Project and other establishment type Republicans say. That is quite extraordinary, How, however long it lasts. That is quite extraordinary. Secondly, uh, the court system. Uh, Trump has really, you know, remade the federal judiciary. The Supreme Court is one example, but the federal judiciary more broadly uh, in the image of the conservative movement and to the liking uh, of evangelical Christians and other religious conservatives. That will have dramatic consequences for the future. And lastly, uh, I think there is the, the polarization that we've talked about so often in the United States. Uh, of course, it was there before Trump, but I think he's exacerbated it uh, and brought the country to the brink. Uh, and the question uh, that I have is uh, whether it's this time around or whether it's four more years, uh, can America come back and rally around the things that always united us or, or, or are we going to remain a nation divided? It's really three really great points, and we'll get back to discussing some of them. But Daniel, where in that do you fall? Are where? What do you think Donald Trump's legacy could be? Yeah, I certainly don't disagree with what Larry said there, and it's nice to be here. And I have three as well. I mean, the the first that I would say would be Trump's racism uh, and the way that he's emboldened white nationalists in the U.S. but also around the world uh, as well. I mean, it's been his calling card as a politician. Uh, right from the beginning, he got his, uh, you know, support by promoting the racist birther uh, conspiracy theory that Obama wasn't, you know, born in the United States, um, you know, when there was the neo-Nazi protests in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, Trump famously said there were good people on both sides, and most recently, you know, in the first debate with Joe Biden, he 
uh, refuse to disassociate himself from the Proud Boys, uh, a far right vigilante group in uh, you know Portland and many other places uh, as well. Uh, obviously, his anti-immigrant policies policy been part of that too. Um, so that's very much front and center with Trump. Uh, secondly, I'd say his uh, reality TVification of the presidency. I mean, this is where Trump came from. He's not a politician, you know, to start. He's a celebrity, you know, uh, figure known from the tabloid press and then from, you know, the host of the show, uh, The Apprentice. Uh, he's a cable news junkie. Uh, and we see that politics, media, and reality TV and entertainment have all kind of combined in a, uh, a sick sort of way that keeps the ratings going, uh, but has quite detrimental effects on uh, American politics. And third, I actually agree with Larry, the, the most important uh, uh, thing has been the Supreme Court and the courts. I mean, this could affect the US for, uh, you know, for generations, really. It's not just Trump's accomplishment, it's really the Republican Party, the US Senate, and we should remember there's a Senate election going on as well, Mitch McConnell, the head of the US Senate. And I think what we see is, elements of the Republican Party have used Trump in the way that Trump has been so distracting with his, you know, constant tweets uh, and the like to, to really uh, have a power grab, uh, which they've done most successfully in, in, you know, appointing three justices, very conservative justices who could be there for decades on the U.S. Supreme Court. And Shauna, for you, within the framework of misinformation and what happens on the internet, kind of our alternative real world at the moment, um, what has Trump's legacy been there? Misinformation has been normalized in 2020, but to get to where we are now, we have to go right back to, we already talked about it, when he constantly pushed that birther conspiracy theory. But moving into when he became president, he undermined his own science officials by, you know, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, by uh, undermining climate science. That was the pretext for 2020. We then moved into 2020, where we've seen a massive rise in QAnon, conspiracy theories, COVID-19 misinformation, and he has been undermining his own health officials. And that shouldn't be surprising when it comes to what we've seen previously before that. So where we're at now is a, a real lack of critical thinking, widespread on social media, and a grabbing of conspiracy theories such as QAnon, which has been denounced as a domestic terrorist organization and has been a real concern for the FBI for a number of years. And there's been a nodding uh, by Trump to that organization. So where we're at now is a, a real fundamental lack of trust in institutions, both science and, you know, obviously the media and obviously fact checkers. And for Trump's legacy and the next four years, be it Joe Biden or be it Donald Trump, it will take a lot to build up that trust in these institutions, to build up trust in the press and to depolarize what is a really polarized social media landscape right now. Larry, I'm going to pick up on um, something you and Daniel bro brought up about the Republican Party. You say that it's Trump's party now. Can the winds of that just change when it no longer is Trump's party? If, the, if, if tr Trump is no longer in the White House, can that change from Tuesday? I think that's the great question. Uh, I think Republicans are very much at something of a crossroads. Um, the reality is, as much as the uh, traditional conservative Republicans embodied by the Lincoln Project and others, uh, they lament Donald Trump and they oppose him and they make lots of very good points when they do so. Uh, but there's a political calculation be that, that has to be made as well. The reality is their brand of Republican conservatism uh, has been pretty thoroughly repudiated, at least in the last two presidential elections in 2008 uh, and 2012. Granted, Barack Obama was a transformative candidate, but he absolutely drubbed John McCain and Mitt Romney. Uh, there's an awful lot of people who voted for Barack Obama twice who then voted for Donald Trump. Politically speaking, where does that school of conservative republicanism go? They also have to look at, I suppose, the Republicans and the grassroots and who the most likely Republican voters are. When I was a kid growing up, uh, certainly Republicans were associated with the party as being the party of the wealthy. Now, who's most likely to vote Republican? Uh, it's white adults with less than a college degree, an awful lot of people uh, who are strugg struggling economically. How the Republican Party is going to square that circle, that is the, con the, con the country club conservative element, uh, is baffled by Trump. Yet the, uh, I suppose, the people who've been attracted to the party and who brought it to success uh, are equally repelled by some of their thoughts on trade, on internationalism, et cetera. How are they going to square that circle? The Republican Party has some serious questions to answer.
Yeah, Daniel, we talk a lot more about centrism in Ireland and in Europe than they do in America. Is there a place for centrism or centrists in America right now? Where is their home? Well, their home is the Democratic Party. I mean, uh, in some sense, there was a revealing comment that uh, in the Democratic primaries where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said, you know, in Europe, Joe Biden and I wouldn't be in the same party. Uh, and in some sense, what you have, even though the U.S., you have the two-party system, but you actually have, I think, three political parties in the U.S., one which is Trumpist, that's, you know, xenophobic, that's, uh, you know, nationalistic, um, that is maybe pro-military, but, but more isolationist. One that's kind of centrist, which would include, if you like, the Bushes and the Clintons. Um, uh, and then another one on the left, that's kind of the party of Bernie Sanders, which is not represented uh, in this particular election. But, you know, as much as we talk about the divisions of the Republican Party, if, you know, Biden is elected or if he's not, I mean, there are major divisions in the, in the Democratic Party uh, as well. Is Trump going to shoulder a lot of blame for this idea of a divided America or, you know, having a, such a such an idea, ideologically based society when actually, in fact, it's been going on for a lot longer than that? Larry or Daniel, you can jump in on that or Sean. <laughs> Um, look, yeah, I think I think Donald Trump is going to shoulder a lot of the blame, but I think you're you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that these conditions existed before uh, Donald Trump came along. I think Donald Trump, to give the devil his due, uh, I think he grasped what was out there, uh, and I think it was the, what was out there was a real frustration with the leadership the hierarchy of both political parties. Uh, a lot of Democrats thought that their party leadership took a, a walk on them when they endorsed free trade deals, they endorsed foreign wars, et cetera. Um, and I think that Donald Trump saw that that desperation was there in America and that America first sentiment. I mean, the ascend that what continues to be the ascendant thought in the United States is uh, that America should worry about America and American issues first, and largely speaking, not have much to do with the rest of the world. Uh, Trump grasp what was there, but it's been bubbling under the surface uh, for decades now. So yes, he'll get the blame, but it's there a long time. I think both parties deserve a lot of the blame for not answering and speaking to the concerns that a lot of Americans quite legitimately have. And Daniel, you brought up the reality tv ification of the White House and of the presidency, but it's not really the first time we've seen that. We have Ronald Reagan, so someone who um, you know, was a Hollywood actor, had a huge celebrity status, was a great communicator, which is how he did so well in, in politics. Um, but there's a lot of parallel between them. Reagan now is quite revered within his, his party, and he doesn't have a place in the history books that I think some people think Trump will. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think Reagan was a quite polarizing figure in his own time. He's been remembered well because he was much more, you know, successful in terms of gaining popularity than Trump. But you have to remember, I mean, it is the blurring of the lines between, you know, celebrity and politics uh, still. But uh, Reagan was a was a film actor, and uh, you know, he knew how to to follow a script. You know, he knew how to to play uh, a leading man. And he was more popular in part, his policies weren't necessarily popular. Uh, in most cases, they weren't his, his sort of right wing agenda. But personally, he was very popular. He played a kind of, you know, consensual figure that most, if not all Americans could relate to. Whereas Trump is a reality TV star and reality TV stars are, you know, they're outrageous. Um, they do anything to, to shock, to gain attention. Uh, and they're quite polarizing, you know, that uh, they're, you know, he's, uh, watchable, whether you like him or or hate him, uh, but he doesn't have, uh, you know, by any extent, the, the kind of consensus over his personality that that someone like Reagan uh, could have had, and that's partly, I think, the the fractured media cultural environment. Uh, you know, it goes hand in hand with the with the fractured, polarized political landscape that we see. We're getting a couple of questions on on the Supreme Court, so I'm, I'm going to. Uh to move to that and then we're going to get to Shauna on some of that misinformation pieces but uh, both uh, Daniel and Larry you, you brought up the Supreme Court a uh, question from um, Aaron um, in the audience Trump and the Republicans have done a good job of controlling the courts with Trump appointing one quarter of current federal judges and now having a conservative majority on the Supreme Court do you think if Joe Biden wins the election him and the Democrats have to pack Supreme, the Supreme Court and get rid of the filibuster in the Senate to reverse Republican control of the courts and I'm going to add to that if the Republicans had done that in the last um, four years what would have happened? 
that, well, that, that in, in response, I mean, that, that's, that's a, it's, it's a very good question that, that you pose. Um, whether Democrats will pack the court, uh, I don't know. My, my sense is that Joe Biden himself is reluctant to go down that direction. My sense is that Biden is a uh, moderate, something of an institutionalist. Remember, the guy was on Capitol Hill for decades uh, and, you know, ensconced himself pretty well in the Senate and had friends of all different persuasions. They were institutionalists as much as everything else. But I think that because of the Democratic Party and the pull to the left in the Democratic Party and the strength of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, uh, I think if he is elected and if Democrats have control of the Senate, uh, I think the movement in that direction is going to be uh, inexorable. Uh, I think that it will uh, lead in that direction and that, you know, the trajectory then of the court will be interesting to watch. But it will be, it already is a politicized institution, but for anyone who pretends or likes to pretend that it still isn't, um, packing the court certainly will bring it squarely within uh, the realm of electoral politics. Some people might say uh, that's just being honest, uh, but I think that's probably where things will head if Biden's elected. What about if, um, you know, if there's a contested election here, like in 2000? And we've got, um, you know, three support Supreme Court seats, two of which, you know, arguably the Republicans, you know, should not have been able to appoint in the first place. Uh, and then that's the body that's going to try to decide, you know, uh, who has been elected. I mean, I think this is unlikely, but it's possible. I mean, if we get something like Bush v. Gore in uh, 2020, my goodness, you know, we are going to be in a serious position of constitutional legitimacy. Uh, and I don't think Trump particularly cares about the kind of the, the right wing evangelical uh, agenda that's been, you know, driving some of these Supreme Court appointments. But he, sh he you know, he, he surely wants the uh, Supreme Court justice he's appointed to be loyal to him. Uh, and he fully expects that, uh, you know, that the Supreme Court will be able, if possible, to swing the election to him if, it, if it's close. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I concur with, it, with, with Daniel's point about Trump not really caring personal, at a personal level, uh, about those issues. But I think Trump grasped very well uh, the significance of the evangelical movement, especially within the Republican Party. Uh, and what I've been told by a lot of Republicans is that early on, very early in 2015, he went to evangelical leaders and said, I will give you the judges that you want. I will follow through. And in fairness, the man has kept his word to that segment of the population. And that's why they have stuck by him through thick and thin. So politically speaking, uh, whether, whatever about his convictions, politically speaking, uh, it's paid off, it's paid dividends, and it's why he's still in with a fighting chance in this election. And Sean, it does make up a huge part of the online conversation around the election as well, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. All of this is going to play a key role. And one of the biggest concerns is when we head to election night, for example, are we going to get, you know, early telling of the votes that aren't verified? So much so that I was speaking to psychologists who were saying in terms of debunking this information on the night, it's important to start pre-bunking. That's kind of, it's been there before, it's, but it's a new enough concept in terms of warning people of the kind of misinformation that they're going to see. When it comes to the uh, contested election result, it's really important to wait for that and to be aware of the partisanship that you might have in your own mind when you're on social media. So all of this kind of politicizing that's happened, this ultra politicizing, is playing a massive role in the misinformation that we're seeing on social media, so much so that we're all preparing for what could be a wave of misinformation on November 3rd. Um, just before we, we move on to the next section, I just still want to stay on um, his actual legacy for a minute. Daniel, is there anything that he has done that if Biden does win, he won't reverse, that he will look at it and go, actually, that was a pretty good job over the last four years. Thanks, Donald. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure it's... Uh... It's a good question. I mean, I suppose, uh, you know, if you look at some of the things that have happened, you know, diplomatically, like, for example, in the uh, diplomatic relationship between the UAE and, uh, and Israel, you know, I think that's something that, um, you know, will, will go ahead uh, in any case. But I, I do think for the most part, um, Biden will be looking to, to reverse, um, you know, the, the vast majority of things that, uh, that Trump has done. Larry, same question to you. Is there anything you could list that if someone said to you, what's the best thing Donald Trump has done? What, what are your top three? Well, I, I think that at the top of the list has to be 
um, not employing the United States in any foreign wars. I mean, that's been the, the awful legacy, I think, of past Republican and Democratic administrations in recent history. Uh, and ironically, I suppose it's one of the things that led to Donald Trump's election in the first place was the dissatisfaction of the American people uh, with what they regarded as the internationalist bent of the parties. So I would hope that Joe Biden would keep the United States out of armed, com armed conflict. Uh, secondly, I think probably Biden will try to um, and this, this, this is controversial to say in an Irish context, but uh, try to bring back what he would say are American jobs uh, and money back home. I think that that mantra uh, is going to be pursued by presidents, whether they're Republicans uh, or Democrats alike. I think that that's something that's there. Uh, you know, as for a third, uh, I'd struggle, uh, I suppose, um, maybe some of those strong economic numbers that were coming out earlier in Trump's presidency, uh, Biden might try, try to get things back on that track. But, you know, Larry, should we give Trump credit for keeping the U.S. out of foreign wars? Because he came awfully close with Iran, you know, when they, uh, you know, ordered the, the assassination of the leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Iran could have responded very differently, I think, and gotten, gotten the U.S. embroiled in, in a war that would have been an even more disaster than, than Iraq. So I think, I think, you know, yes, Trump has, has done that to an extent, but he, he also got lucky. Yeah, I think I, 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 well, I, I, I would say that's true. But, but again, just speaking politically, one of the things that Trump uh, grasped and got right, and I think captured where a lot of Americans are, is he decided he was going to do things differently. And we can disagree or agree uh, on what he's done right and done wrong, and he's done an awful lot wrong, but that he was not going to take his cue from the military industrial establishment uh, that pre pre the Republicans and Democrats who preceded him have. And I actually think that that has been largely uh, a welcome development, uh, given what Amer the, fa the myriad failures in American foreign policy in recent years. Shauna, looking at Tuesday, everybody, well, everybody, most people in America have been voting long before uh, Tuesday, and we've seen record numbers. Um, but in 2016, there was a lot of talk throughout the campaigns and obviously for the years afterwards about Russian disinformation impacting the election. What kind of disinformation or misinformation are we seeing in this campaign, in this election? It's something that many people are talking about in terms of, for example, CrowdStrike. They're an intelligence firm that was involved in looking at 2016, but many others, in that right now it's important to not overstate the role of foreign interference. Um, of course, there has been some reports, but to understand an influence campaign, you have to see how influential it really is. And there hasn't been any indication that there's been any influential influence campaign that's been involved in this election. And to take a, a big spotlight on foreign influence, and again, there's no question in 2016, Russia played a, a big part in that election. But looking now, uh, I would say from the evidence we have now, it's the domestic disinformation that has been a real cause for concern and will be a cause for concern in the days to come. Many people saying that, for example, CrowdStrike are just one of those who've echoed that sentiment. So in terms of calling the results early, uh, all, all of that kind of uh, the concerns that we've been seeing ramping up over the past few weeks or the undermining of mail-in voting, that's just another example. Um, that, that's a real key issue here. And who's behind that? I think it, it, this is all, most of it is really just homegrown disinformation now, and it's a reflection of how partisan America has become, the United States has become. Uh, it is, you know, been building up for years and years and years. You can't take 2020 in isolation when it comes to misinformation. And I think the reason why there's been a real ramping up of mis misinformation and domestic disinformation has been the year that has been 2020. You've had the undermining constantly in the years previously to that. You have people who are not trusting the mainstream media like they've never had before, many people not trusting the so-called mainstream media. And you move into 2020 when we have a global pandemic. And when there's any time of crisis, misinformation is sown often along parts and lines or often along a particular bias. But this year, when we have the global pandemic, that's amplified now more than ever. I don't think we would have had QAnon as big as it is if it hadn't been for... Uh, the global pandemic uh, and all that has come with it. So uh, we can't take anything in isolation to what has brought us to this point. And much of that misinformation and disinformation is along those deep, deep partisan lines that has been drawn for years before that. Yeah, because QAnon, obviously, the, the, 
Trump has been asked about them on num- a number of occasions, has kind of pled innocence that he doesn't know who they are in, in some interviews. How big a role are they playing right now? And is there any stopping them? Will they stop if, if Donald Trump doesn't get elected? Will the big networks, the big social networks be able to stop them? So QAnon is an unfounded conspiracy theory, completely baseless, that claims that there is a deep state and Donald a deep state pedophile ring and Donald Trump is the only hope in saving it. Now, that started in the US and it started really off the back of the Pizzagate conspiracy theory, which claimed that Hillary Clinton was running some sort of pedophile ring outside of a pizza restaurant in DC. It started on an image board 4chan. And this shows you how something that starts on 4chan, which is an image board often known for very, very um, dangerous views. Uh, A lot of misinformation and very dangerous stuff comes from 4chan. It moved then uh, to broader circles. So then we have QAnon, which is an extension of that. But again, the only reason why QAnon, I think, has become so big as to what it is, is because of the year that 2020 has become. Because QAnon has managed to intertwine itself with traditional pandemic conspiracy theories. Pandemic doesn't exist. Uh, Anti-vax conspiracy theories. It's all intertwined into one now. And that's what's been difficult. Um, Donald Trump has been asked about it. He's kind of nodded towards them uh, by retweeting content that's been happening for months. So that, that's been ramping up. But in terms of big tech trying to take an aim at them, we know that Facebook uh, and Twitter, TikTok, even Patreon, which is a platform for where influencers can connect and make money, uh, they have all taken aim at QAnon. And so far, it's been quite actually successful. We monitor QAnon groups uh, on CrowdTangle. It's a tool we use to monitor likes, comments, and shares. And that has drastically dropped. But when you move from one platform to another, it doesn't necessarily mean that a movement's gonna end because those movements often move to platforms like Telegram, which is an encrypted messaging platform. And that's where they can grow in an unmodified space. And that's difficult for fact checkers because this is not an open platform like Facebook anymore. It's a closed off platform. So that's gonna be the next step as to whether they're gonna grow more in here or whether it's gonna dissipate. And if we see the back of the pandemic, which I think all of us would hope to uh, in the months ahead, then will there be a building up of trust again? That's gonna be a big question for QAnon and the other conspiracy theories that have really blown out of many people's proportions. We wouldn't have seen it move into this mainstream as, as we've had. Yeah, especially in Ireland as well. Um, that's kind of the extreme side of the disinformation. But I guess there's misinformation on both sides as well. How has that been manifesting itself in the pro-Biden, anti-Trump uh, arena? So 2020 has seen the mainstreaming of misinformation, I would say. And one thing that we all have to remember is that you don't need your high tech. You don't need your AI. You would need nothing to sow misinformation And it is often along those uh, partisan lines. We've seen both pro-Trump and pro-Biden. And I say, when I say pro-Biden, I I mean more so anti-Trump, for example, the Lincoln Project, both have been engaging in just taking clips out of context and then sharing them onto social media. Uh, Or, you know, very simply, really uh, easily edited clips. For example, the Trump campaign shared a video of Joe Biden and it looked like he was asleep during uh, an interview, televised interview, but that actually never happened. There was somebody who fell asleep in an interview in local news. It wasn't Joe Biden. Similarly, uh, in an anti-Trump way, the Lincoln Project have shared videos before. One such video, for example, taking... Fox News commentator Laura Ingram out of context, making it seem that she was saying something disparaging about Donald Trump, which she didn't. And when it comes to uh, misinformation about Donald Trump, there's many things that, uh, many videos that are just simply taken out of context. One such video we saw that garnered uh, hundreds of thousands of views was a video that made it look like Donald Trump was just going for a wander in front of the White House. Uh, But in fact, if you had seen the clip longer, he was just walking towards Melania Trump. And many people were pushing that as evidence that, for example, there might be something wrong with Trump's mental health. That's That's something that's been pushed actually on both sides of the political aisle. So you have to be really careful on those really edited clips or screenshots, always look for the original and always try to take everything into context when you're looking at all that. 
And one of the big stories of the last few weeks has been this Hunter Biden laptop. It's something that hasn't gained a huge amount of traction here. So you might explain what the story is um, how and how it has been managed by the media in America and also the social networks. So Hunter Biden has always, you know, really been this big move for the Republicans, particularly when he was on the board of Burisma, that's an oil, that's a gas company in Ukraine, when he became uh, a board member in 2014. So there has been uh, calls for the Republicans suggesting that perhaps Joe Biden was involved somehow in those business agreements. So the New York Post then published what they said uh, was evidence from emails uh, that Hunter Biden and and Joe Biden met up with a board member, this is just one, one allegation, uh, met up with a board member of Burisma. Therefore, backing up what they said was big evidence that uh, Joe Biden had inappropriate dealings with Hunter Biden uh, and all that tangled mess. The big difficulty with regards to this is that uh, the Post said that they uh, got these emails from Rudy Giuliani, uh, that they, they got a hard drive from Rudy Giuliani, which is Trump's personal lawyer, and then the backstory of where these emails came from, or even if these emails exist, it's not exactly verified. There's very little verified with regards to the story, so much so that the FBI haven't yet issued a big statement with regards to all of this. That's why it's difficult to cover a story like this, particularly when you're talking about verification. Uh, you know, putting this alongside, for example, WikiLeaks, when you, you had the email drop, it's very difficult to get any sort of solid evidence on this. So that's more so where we come in, where we were monitoring here in your news was how social media companies are going to deal with that. And what we saw was Twitter blocking the URL for the post story, um, the New York Post story and Facebook doing a similar move. And then Twitter backtracking from that, saying that it was a mistake. What's happened there is that that's become a real partisan issue. We saw the CEOs of tech companies testifying in front of the Senate committee just yesterday, and that was a massive talking point with regards to how Twitter dealt with that. Uh, they, Twitter have said that the Post has to delete that original tweet and they can retweet it again in order for them to get back into their Twitter account. And so that's how the actions of big tech in dealing with stories like this or misinformation has also become part of campaigning, but there's also a big spotlight on it too. Larry, that the Republicans or some of the Republicans really wanted that Hunter Biden laptop story to be the Hillary Clinton emails of, of 2016. Has it landed in any way with the electorate? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the, one of the first things I say, one of my constant mantras is that perception matters more than truth in politics, especially in the United States. Uh, and that's why I think some of what Shauna says is is terrifying and why her work is so important, I, I think, is bears repeating. But in terms of the, the, uh, the Hunter Biden story, it just hasn't uh, it hasn't landed, in my view. Um, I think that the people who have an issue with Hunter Biden and his dealings, um, I think a lot of us have legitimate ethical questions about what he was up to over there. But in terms of being a major issue, a major factor in this election, uh, I think anybody who's been moved by it was already in Donald Trump's corner uh, anyway. Uh, I think an awful lot of Americans who can relate to the issue of substance abuse and addiction, uh, I think they see Hunter Biden as a sad figure, uh, one who I suppose exists all over the United States states. And I think they look at Joe Biden uh, as a father uh, who loved his son uh, and made mistakes uh, in that respect. I just don't think it's going to be uh, the October surprise of something that's going to move the needle uh, whatsoever. And I think Republicans have probably wasted too much time on it. It was it also a mistake going for his family, knowing the, the tragedies that we know about Biden's family? Does that Was that also a factor? And it's actually quite hard to get people angry about somebody's family when they have gone through that, those kind of traumas that they have. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that assessment. And I think uh, in the debates, uh, I think Biden missed a trick. I think if Biden had uh, given that sort of statement that, look, he's my son, he made mistakes, I probably made some mistakes too, but I did it because I'm his dad and I love him. And I think if he had said that, I think a lot of Americans would have said, that's it, case closed. I think a lot of them probably did anyway. But I think a moment like that in a debate would have done him a huge amount of good. Now, of course, the chatter is going to continue uh, and there's going to be charges the mainstream media is covering up. But I think most Americans, it really doesn't move them. Daniel, on that, do you think that there will be that this is playing, and, and Shauna mentioned that this online world is playing into the two Americas of the real world? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, the further polarization of the US, and I would just add 
along uh, with what Sean was saying, which was quite important, that the importance of, you know, I talked about the birth or conspiracy theory earlier, obviously have other conspiracy theories, the kind of the great, Repla great replacement theory and others that are promoted by white nationalists. And like with uh, QAnon, the white nationalists view Trump as someone who is on their side, you know, who, who has their back and who's going to, to truly fight for, you know, uh, threaten white people in the United States. So the conspiracism and the racism, you know, uh, fit together, especially in this online world that, you know, begins with 4chan, 8chan, and then, you know, moves out further into the, into the mainstream. I'm just going to uh, pause for a second just to call out if anyone we're getting your questions and thanks very much we'll we'll go move to the questions towards the end but if uh, anyone else has any questions just to pop them into the Q&A box and we will get to them. Uh, Daniel back to you on that global white nationalism because you have written books and, and a lot of your work is um, focused on this. Is there any way that Trump can completely distance himself from it? You know, he has tried in debates or post debates mostly to do it. Um, but is the root of his success actually in white nationalism, even if he doesn't realize it himself? Oh, he, I think he realizes it himself. I think he's he's very candy. I mean, he gave his first campaign speech, uh, you know, in, in 2015, and he said the problem was, you know, Mexico was sending its rapists, its murderers. Uh, across the board to the U.S. And, and some of them, he said, were good people. And that's exactly the kind of, you know, thing that Trump does that's canny. He, he leaves himself some kind of plausible deniability, uh, but the people that he wants to get the message to, you know, um, uh, the white supremacists, they're getting the message. Um, you know, so after Charlottesville, when he says, well, some, there are good people on both sides, uh, then David Duke and others say, okay, Trump is with us. And a few days later, when he, you know, recants that and, and apologizes, it doesn't stop the, the white nationalists from thinking that Trump's on their side. They just think, okay, well, that's something he had to say from the media. So, you know, and I think Trump is, is very well aware of that, that he's, uh, he's quite deliberately been speaking to that audience. They've liked Trump, uh, you know, from the beginning, they've been uh, some of his strongest supporters and, and knows exactly what he's doing. Does calling him out for that actually help his base stay with him sometimes because they don't see themselves as racist. They certainly don't see themselves as white nationalists. And by calling them that, they become more angry or more disenfranchised with the establishment, with the mainstream media, with the commentators that they hear saying this. I suppose so. I mean, in, in the sense that, that Trump took on, you know, what he called political correctness um, was part of his appeal that, you know, that you had, I mean, and, and let's be honest, you know, for, for decades, Republican politicians have appealed to, to the racist vote in the US, but they didn't do it in the explicit way that, that Trump did. And by doing so, Trump has allowed, you know, many Americans to say, okay, he's willing to, to actually speak the truth. He's willing to, to tell it like it is. Um, so I think there's, there's that element uh, to it uh, for sure. I think the problem is I'm not sure that you can, um, you know, you can have majority popular support uh, in the U.S. with uh, the explicit level of racism that he's, he's given. And, and, you know, a lot of more middle of the road Americans who might unconsciously hold, you know, uh, racist attitudes, they're, they're kind of disgusted, I suppose, by uh, some, of the, some of the ways that Trump has behaved uh, in this regard. Larry, has Trump actually done anything for those people who maybe use this language um, consciously or unconsciously, the idea of taking America back, making America great again? Um, a lot of the language that Daniel is talking about there is because of people feeling like they're left behind. Has Trump actually done anything for them in the last four years? Well, I, I think he's spoken to them. Uh, and I think that a lot of those people would say at least he's speaking to us uh, in, in terms and in language that we can understand, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the leadership of the other two parties for many, many years. And I think that a lot of those voters, especially in places like Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, would have felt very much abandoned by the Democratic Party. Now, I think at the core of this, Trump is fighting against the tide. Uh, a lot of those jobs that he says he can get back 
uh, simply aren't coming back. He's done some things to get them back. And again, I would give him a limited amount of credit on that front. Uh, so there is uh, that element of speaking to people and them reacting favorably to it as when, as they as they weren't to before. But the one thing I would just just say in terms of, of Trump's appeal um, and, and this idea of making America great again, uh, I've always thought that race was an ingredient of it. That he is cynically, uh, and I think in many instances despicably, uh, used race as, a, as element, an element of his appeal. But I've never thought it was central to his appeal. Uh, and I think that it is one of many different factors. And in that regard, uh, the one thing I would say just to, to Daniel is in terms of white supremacy and white nationalism and Trump's tacitly stoking those flames, it is kind of strange against that backdrop uh, that at least in percentage terms, Donald Trump did better among African-Americans last time around uh, than either John McCain or Mitt Romney. And there are rumors now that he's doing very well with African-American males, or at least better than expected with African-American males. And likewise, at the same time, he's running very strongly with self-described Latino Americans between one third and 40 percent of the vote. And I just put it that, yes, race is there. And I think it's uh, unfortunate. But it is kind of difficult to explain the theory that it's central when he enjoys that level of support. Daniel, do you want to add anything? Yeah, to that? well, I mean, I suppose what I'd say is, uh, and of course, you know, there's um, multiple appeals that Trump has. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, yeah, you know, look, uh, Obama was uh, the first black president. Of course, he was going to be a super high percentage of African American votes. So I wouldn't really compare it to 2008, 2012 necessarily. But also, I think, you know, there are African Americans who are, uh, you know, appeal, <laughs> who find the sort of xenophobic appeal, the anti-immigrant appeal, the build a wall appeal to be real. There are also uh, Latino voters who also feel a difference between you know, themselves and uh, you know, immigrants coming over the border or who perhaps find uh, an anti-black you know, racial message uh, appealing. Uh, and also many of those voters are uh, voting, I suppose, on the basis of religious you know, values that, that, that they're part of the evangelical or um, you know, conservative uh, Catholic uh, base that that Trump has uh, has won over, but I agree largely with Larry that that racism is just one component of uh, of Trump's appeal. It, it doesn't explain you know the the whole of it. He's not you know Trump is not David Duke, uh, but he has courted David Duke and uh, made him you know part of his coalition in a way that previous Republican uh, presidents had not. Just for anybody who doesn't know uh, who David Duke is, just a, a couple of lines just to explain uh, who he is. Yeah, so Duke is a, he's a former Klansman who then, you know, entered uh, electoral uh, politics. So he's a Klansman and, and neo-Nazi, um, but uh, who has been on the, if you like, the, the fringes of the Republican Party and who was one of the leaders in, in the neo-Nazi rally in, in Charlottesville in 2017. And if people are interested in more about him, I'll plug another podcast. There's an excellent slow burn podcast uh, about Duke and a good uh, Spike Lee film as well, uh, based on uh, tangentially based on uh, some of his work. Shauna, if Trump isn't uh, elected uh, this time out, without that leader, could some of this online rhetoric just dissipate? I think we're living in a world now where there is always going to be echo chambers uh, in daily life, not only in social media, listening to the same kind of people, but also on social media. And that has created um, a really difficult world in social media, bearing in mind that misinformation and polarization isn't just happening in the US, it, it, it's happening right here in, in Europe too. There's a lot of misinformation here in Europe. So the undermining of institutions isn't just a US centric problem. Saying that, um, I think if there was a move to build more trust in particularly scientific institutions, it could re it could dis build um, critical thinking, which is key to tackling misinformation. I would say understanding, you know, the scientific method, for example, is is crucial, and to build uh, critical thinking widely in a society is key. If there is a depolarization too, that's key because. We can talk about algorithms all day, and of course they, they play such a key and crucial role, but a lot of the polarization that we see in social media is often a reflection of societal values too. Um, before we go to uh, the audience questions, Larry, I know you mentioned Pennsylvania, so I think I'm taking that as you're dying to talk about polls and, and the current state of play. 
Um, where are we at? Just catch us up on, you know, headline uh, headlines are saying Biden's going to win. Um, how how much stock can we put in those headlines? Well, look, I mean, last time around, you know, the common creed, and I, I think it's true, is that Donald Trump won the presidency because he won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, states that hadn't been won by a Republican since the 1980s. Uh, at present, uh, my read of the polls and my instinct is that Donald Trump is probably safe in both Wisconsin and, uh, sorry, that Joe Biden is probably going to win uh, both Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, my sense of Pennsylvania is somewhat more mixed. Uh, the polls still have him, the real clear polls aggregate still has uh, Biden almost four percentage points ahead. Uh, but there's lots of uh, other stories out there about what's bubbling along or on the surface and on the ground um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and this is something that we can't really discount because of what happened last time uh, when you know the, Trump took everybody by surprise. Uh, and this idea of an enthusiasm gap that exists on the ground. That is, people are very enthusiastic for Donald Trump. Biden's people aren't really enthused about him. They just want to get rid of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and what the situation is on the ground there, it's hard to tell. Uh, I think Pennsylvania is going to be a place to really watch. Now, if we look at the other states, um, you know, they are very, very close. They're within the margin of error in most instances. Um, so, it, it, you know, look, there's multiple scenarios that could unfold here. There could be a blue wave. Joe Biden could run away with this thing. I don't think that's all that likely. Uh, on the other hand, um, Donald Trump, uh, you know, could pull off an upset. He'd need to win everywhere he won last time, as well as, uh, you know, in, in, in key Pennsylvania, et cetera. That's, you know, again, a tall ask. Or uh, Biden could win this thing narrowly uh, based on the, the, the states that, uh, that are out there that are in play. So there are three potential scenarios as I see it. The third, in my view, is the most likely. Uh, but again, there's a, you know, there's a volatility out there. And I have a niggling feeling about Pennsylvania. And if, if Trump wins Pennsylvania, then Biden's path to the White House isn't blocked. But it all of a sudden becomes a lot more complicated. What's your niggling feeling based on? My niggling feeling is based, I suppose, it's a reticence uh, uh, based on last time. And it's also some of the things uh, that I've been reading by journalists on the ground uh, in Pennsylvania uh, about the depth of enthusiasm that remains there uh, for, jo for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I think two things. First, I think Biden was probably foolish to make that statement uh, at the end of the last debate uh, about putting oil uh, and fossil fuels beyond use. Objectively, he's right. But politically speaking, I think his advisors probably wish he hadn't said that. Uh, also, I, because it's big business in Pennsylvania, accounts for a lot of jobs. But also, though, I was struck by a quote I read in a piece in the New York Times by a woman who said, I'm tired of people coming up and telling me that I'm a racist because I'm a Republican. And I just wonder uh, about the left's capacity to alienate middle of the road, non relatively non-ideological voters who are, exist in teams in, in places like Pennsylvania, in that vast hinterland between, uh, between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, the two urban centers. So I think Pennsylvania is really a place to watch. And again, if Trump manages something there, uh, then things get more complicated. What is the huge turnout so far, the early turnout telling us? Uh, I, you know, look, both parties are kind of spinning that both way, different ways. Uh, you, you, in one sense, you would have to look at, you know, from, I, I suppose, standing back and looking at it, perhaps uh, from a logical point of view, you'd have to think maybe it's a good thing for Democrats, that these uh, probably are voters who are dues to go out for the first time, that they're getting out, that they, they, you know, they, they may have been disenfranchised before, uh, and here they are taking the, every opportunity to get out. Republicans are saying, look, it's a lot of older people, uh, you know, exercising their right before the day. I think in the end, uh, I think it's a mistake to read too much into what the early turnout means. Uh, I think it varies on a state by state basis as to who uh, it might benefit. So I just don't know. What I think is going to be fascinating to watch is uh, the count process in all of that will unfold because this really is an unprecedented way to conduct uh, an American presidential election. I'm going to take a question from the audience now because that kind of fits in uh, with what Nessa is asking and Daniel fits in with what you were saying earlier as well. Will Trump go if he loses? What do you reckon, Daniel? 
think a lot depends on the the margin of victory, I suppose. Um, you know, and also depends on how to what extent he would be supported by the Republican Party. I mean, I think if Biden wins, uh, you know, a clear and decisive victory, um, you know, Trump may uh, make some noises. He won't be happy to be a loser. Loser certainly, but he'd have very little support uh, for staying in office. If it's a very close, you know, uh, uh, election, one that you could say is more contested, then I think we're in more dangerous territory. And I think the, the key people will be people like Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Senate Republicans and other Republican leaders who will have to decide at that point, you know, if they're really going to gonna back Trump and his claims or if they're going to, you know, leave him out to, uh, to dry. But but yeah, it, it could happen. But but, you know, if, it, if it's a clear victory by Biden, if he wins a bunch of more states than, than Trump and, you know, is up eight, nine, you know, uh, points in the in the popular vote, then I don't think anyone's going to back Trump trying to trying to stick around. Donna, on that, my hot take is that Trump actually doesn't like the job that much and he just likes the tweeting social media element of it. Could he just go and just become a, a, a social media TV star again? We'll have to wait and see. Um, but I, I, I guess um, on a more serious note, the tweeting on the night of the election is going to be something that fact checkers and social media platforms are going to have to tackle with if there is any sort of calling of the result early uh, without knowing it. I've seen a lot of analysis with regards to this and how, how the media are going to have to handle that because if you uh, then say Trump calls X state without that result coming in, that, that that's going to create a narrative and that's going to be difficult to control. So it's going to be very important on the night of the election when the results come in to be very definitive on those results, either side because of how polarized it is and not to fit into any sort of bias. And for social media companies to stick to the policies that they've set out weeks ago. That's going to be interesting too. Uh, obviously, conservatives has said that there is an anti-conservative bias in social media. So how they're going to, to, to enforce those policies on the night of the election is also going to be one to watch. Yeah, and that goes to uh, kind of not finding out as well because of the postal voting. We mightn't have a, a full clear picture of the results unless probably, um, Larry, you might, uh, take me up on this. If we get an early result in Florida, does that mean that there won't be much conjecture after that? Well, in in my view, uh, Florida is an absolute must win for Donald Trump. I, I don't see a path to victory for him uh, unless he won, unless he wins Florida. Uh, I think if Biden wins uh, Florida, I think it, you know I, I wouldn't call it, but I'd say that it, you know it's it's headed in a pretty clear trajectory. Um, there is some. It should be noted that although the counting is going to take a while. Um, the number crunches say that they will be able to give us a pretty good picture of forecast based on their uh, nuanced methodologies. They'll be able to give us a pretty good forecast, um, you know, if not Tuesday night on Wednesday, early on Wednesday, uh, as to how this thing is shaping up. Unless, of course, it's extremely, extremely close. Um, two more questions, Larry, for you on polling from Adam and Antoine in the audience. Um, from Adam, if Biden wins Texas, is it over for Trump? And how likely is that? And from Antoine, to what extent are polls being skewed by Trump supporters not declaring their voting intentions? So that quiet Fianna Fáil thing that we have here, the shy Fianna Fáilers, is there shy Trumpers? Okay, if, if Biden wins Texas, it's over. We can call it very early, and it's going to be an extraordinary blue wave if Joe Biden wins Texas. Uh, I don't think Joe Biden will win Texas. I, I'm virtually certain he won't. I'll be shocked if he does. I'll put it to you that way. Um, in terms of the shy Trump voters and whether they're being missed by the polls, look, that's what's being put out there by Trump supporters and by Republic, some Republican operatives that the, uh, the polls are way off. Um, look, there's a lot of data, and I know Noel Rock is writing about it today in the journal, that last time this narrative that the polls were way, were way off, they actually weren't uh, all that far off if you look at where they ended up just before the election. Um, I, I, you know, again, I just... I would think that the pollsters, either they take a scientific approach to these things. Um, the extent to which they'd have to be off, uh, mm -hmm. especially in places like Michigan or Wisconsin, um, to precipitate this sort of dramatic Trump win that some people still think he's going to get, uh, I just don't accept that. Uh, of course, there are places where they're within the margin of error that could go either way, places like Iowa, Georgia, um, North Carolina, um, even Arizona. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, to get to that point where they're totally off, off the mark, uh, I just find that very difficult to believe. 
If anyone ever met a shy supporter of Donald Trump, most of them <laughs> are exactly the opposite of shy, I would say. Well, I mean, there, there, are, there, are, there are some. I mean, there, there are some. I know some, and some of them are my friends. Uh, but whether they're numerous enough to, uh, to make up the margins that's in the polling, I just don't know. Um, Daniel, this is a question from Carly, uh, probably best place for you. What do, the, do you think might be the fallout if Joe Biden manages to take it next week? And how might the U.S. begin to heal? Well, yeah, well, so in a Biden uh, victory would present, you know, a number of, I think, interesting political challenges. Uh, I mentioned before, I mean, the Democratic Party is quite divided. So Biden will have a decision to make in terms of how he wants to govern, you know, whether he wants to push the progressive agenda, whether he wants to govern, uh, you know, from uh, the center uh, to try to retain his uh, majority, especially among sort of moderate you know, former Republican, you know, affluent suburban voters who would have been key, I think, to his victory if he, if he does win. Um, so I think there'll be lots of interesting questions and uh, there may be an impulse to heal on the basis of Biden, which would be, you know, obviously a good thing. But the problem with that, the attempt to heal too much, and I think we saw this with Obama in his first couple of years, he tried to be really nice to the Republicans and have a bipartisan consensus. And the Republicans aren't interested in this. I mean, uh, I think Steve Bannon had a quote like, you know, uh, we're bringing, you know, Republicans are bringing a knife to the fight and Democrats are bringing a pillow. So, you know, uh, Biden's going to have to determine whether he wants to, to make a nice sort of statement and let the Republicans, um, you know, get away with murder as they have been, or whether he wants to make, uh, you know, a real effort to kind of fight back and, and actually try to to get power and to shift things in the direction where Democrats could really, you know, dominate American politics for, for a generation. All right, that reminds me of something I was going to ask you, because um, you brought up uh, Steve Bannon there, Daniel. Trump had a huge amount of smart people around him when he got elected in 2016, but he fired most of them over the last four years. Um, he was elected, he had cherry picked a lot of the impactful things that previous presidents had done. We've mentioned Ronald Reagan already, the fake news elements of Richard Nixon, um, Make America Great Again was, I think Bill Clinton had said it. Um, is that what he's missing this time? Is this, this, is this why he doesn't seem to have a coherent strategy or nothing is landing for him like it did with Hillary Clinton? Perhaps, but I think also he's just, um, he doesn't have many cards to play. I mean, the thing is in 2016, Trump was the outsider he was running against a candidate who, I mean, Trump was, by the way, the most unpopular candidate in American presidential history, but he was running against the second most unpopular, Hillary Clinton, and he had a, you know, favorable electoral college uh, map, um, you know, but he was the outsider, so he made the election in 2016 a referendum on Hillary Clinton, who was pretty unpopular, and he managed to, to have a narrow path to victory that way. He can't do that now that he's been, you know, been in office for four years. 2020 is going to be a referendum on Trump. People know who Trump is. They know what he's done, you know, at this point. Um, so he can't really be, you know, um, the same kind of figure in 2016 than he was in 2020. So I don't, I don't think it matters if, uh, you know, Bannon or some of his other advisors were still around. He just has very limited cards that that he can play uh, other than just hope that to uh, hold on to his base and, and eke out a narrow win uh, in which he loses the popular vote again. Great. I still have a good few questions coming in, so I'll try and fly through them and maybe just shout if you want to take them, guys. Um, question from James. With changing demographics in the US, is this the last of the Republican Party as we know it? Will it split along right wing and centrist lines? Larry, go. Um, you know the that, that's that's you know that's the question I think lots of different people uh, are asking, and I, I think you know in many ways um, it is down to we talk, the questioner asked about changing demographics. It is down to this great unknown in terms of how Latino Americans, which is the ver the fastest growing segment uh, of the electorate in the United States, how they're going to break politically speaking. I think that that might uh, shape the destiny of American politics, at least in the short term, as much as anything else. Now, it had always been envisaged by the Democratic Party that they were natural Democratic voters, that they would form the basis of a new Democratic majority going forward. But some of those numbers, which I referred to earlier, uh, indicate that they're not quite the same as African Americans. And indeed, some political theorists think that they could be more like Irish Americans in their political orientation. That is, 
fairly evenly divided between the two parties. Uh, if they are, then that changes a lot of the equations completely with respect uh, to demographics. Uh, the Republican Party, uh, on that front, if they are to be, uh, you know, more welcoming of the Latino vote and the Latinos coming into the party, uh, at some stage they are going to have to question some of the uncompromising uh, immigration rhetoric that they've been put forward, that Donald Trump and others have been put have been putting forward. Um, the audience for that is limited. Uh, in my view, that audience of their, their most fervent supporters, white Americans with less than a college degree, that demographic is aging. They're dying every day. Um, so those are the kind of calculations that I think uh, are going to go into this. But Daniel is right. Both parties in different ways uh, are at a crossroads in this election. This is a similar question because you had already called the Republican Party, the party of Trump now. But could we see any of Trump's children run in future elections? Um, that's another question from Aaron. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's what you hear at that. You know, you hear reports at the rallies that everyone say everyone says that Don Jr. is the man for 2024. Um, you know, look, who knows what might lie ahead? I tend not to put an awful lot of stock uh, in those sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, look, I wouldn't have put a lot of stock in Donald Trump winning the Republican nomination for president in 2016. Shauna, the, the Trump family are as active online as their dad is. Um, what has that played into the narrative of, of the information that we're seeing um, around the campaigns? I think it's been kind of echoing much of what he said on his own social media. And it, it has been, you know, deeply partisan and polarizing and often, you know, uh, pushing things like, you know, back back a couple of months ago was hydroxychloroquine the big cure. It wasn't just Donald Trump talking about that. We know we had Don Jr. saying the exact same thing. And we, what we've seen in terms of a reflection of Don Jr.'s Twitter account is uh, not, not really kind of fact-checking stuff before he puts it up. For example, we saw a picture that went up on Donald, Don Jr.'s Twitter account just a couple of days ago that had caps on it and uh, there was two rappers and it said MAGA. However, it was pretty clear that it actually wasn't MAGA on these caps. It was a really shoddy Photoshop that he then had to remove once it became blatantly clear that this was actually not a true picture. Now, many people would laugh at that, but it also shows, you know, the, the putting up of something that's just simply not verified at all, it wasn't true, it would have been very easy to go back and look to see whether that is true or not. So that just links into the, to the normalization of putting stuff out to your hundreds, thousands, millions of people that will see this, uh, often unverified information. Uh, but Don Jr., uh, you know, as well as uh, as others, has been saying that there is this conservative bias against him. That's something that Donald Trump has said with regards to social media platforms. It is important to note in terms of data, crowd angle analysis, likes, comments, and shares. You know, Donald Trump is consistently among the top performing, but Don Jr. still says, you know, he, he's claimed that there is an algorithmic bias against him. So, in terms of the uh, how tech platforms work. Don Jr. has played into that kind of debate, but also in terms of the normalization of misinformation too, that's also happened, not only with Donald Trump. I'm going to jump to another polling question. Uh, sorry, Larry, but Dolores wants to know, does the polling suggest a change in the Senate and Congress? Uh, the polling doesn't su suggest any change in, in the House of Representatives. That is, Democrats will keep their advantage there, barring something uh, totally unforeseen. Um, the polling in the Senate I is very interesting. There are a lot of very close run uh, Senate races where I think some candidates uh, on the Republican side are making uh, some very difficult decisions right now as to how they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the president, depending on the state that they're in. Uh, at the moment, you'd have to think Democrats have a reasonably good chance at just, and I mean just, uh, taking control uh, of the Senate. Uh, but that's going to be down to an awful lot of factors. And while some people have discounted um, the, you know, the discordant or disruptive role uh, of early voting and postal voting, et cetera, in the presidential election, uh, I think its effects might be felt in a far more significant way uh, in individual states in those very close Senate races. And I'm going to take this as the last question and apologies that we haven't, I still have a few that I haven't got to, but I'm conscious of the time and people probably need to get back to their other Zoom calls or whatever plans people have uh, in these funny times. Um, does the panel think Trump will spend the rest of, this is a question from Andrew, does the panel think Trump will spend the rest of his life post-presidency in and out of courts over his business finances? And I'm just going to broaden that out to 
if Trump loses on, on Tuesday, what do you think he will do over the next few years? Uh, Daniel, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that's quite possibly going to be the case from what we learned about Trump's finances, and we'll learn more if he no longer has the protection of the presidency. But I don't think he's going to stop tweeting. I don't think he's going to stop being a political uh, figure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right, uh, Shanae, that he's not, he doesn't really like the job of president, but he hates losing, you know, more than that. Uh, and he cares so much about his own ego and his own fame. So I, I think we will continue to hear a great deal from Trump. He'll still have a constituency. And I guess the question will be, you know, how many people continue to, to pay him uh, any attention? Shauna, same to you. And you can give us a prediction if you want, but I won't make you. Um, I think in terms of misinformation, uh, it's going to be difficult to tell. But I think that Twitter has been his megaphone, and I don't think that that's going to stop anytime soon. And in terms of how he's been performing on social media, it's been very, very loud and has consistently been. So if the past is anything to tell, uh, he'll be loud on social media in the years to come, most likely. And Larry, do you think that there could be legal consequences for Trump's actions post or during his presidency, or will he be protected? Well, first off, I don't think he'll go gently into that good night one way or another, regardless of what happens. In terms of the legal challenges, uh, you know, he could. Absolutely. As a matter of law, he absolutely could face a whole range of different charges at both the state and federal levels. But it goes back to something that Daniel said a few minutes ago uh, about Biden as potential healer. And in that context, I wonder if uh, decisions will be made behind closed doors about healing the United States. And that means people who voted for Donald Trump and trying to ease the rifts in the country and whether that is best accomplished by having uh, Donald Trump in a former president, albeit a, you know, a controversial one in and out of court or perhaps in an orange jumpsuit, uh, my tendency is to think that he might escape on some of that stuff in the name of healing the nation. Great. Um, guys, I, I said at the start that I'd give you a little bit of a chance to make sure that our audience knew where to find you. And I think they'll probably want to after that a, a great hour of, of conversation. Uh, Shauna, where would people find you and your work if they go to seek you out? Uh, all on Euronews, The Cube. So we are a segment that's across Euronews uh, TV. We're on social media too. Euronews, you'll find us fact-checking and fighting this information and hopefully trying to build up trust with regards to verification. Thanks so much for today. Daniel, your, your 30 seconds to plug yourself. Well, you can go to my website at, uh, at Trinity. I've got a personal website that links from there as well. Um, check out a book that I've been involved with, uh, one of the editors of, called Global White Nationalism from Apartheid to Trump that was just published in the last few weeks that explores the kind of historical roots of um, the white nationalism that we see in the US and in the world today. And Larry, tell us about your multiple media appearances that I presume you have booked in between now and, and uh, the end of November. Yeah, if the, the moral of the story is if you don't like me, don't turn on a radio or TV for the next few days because I'm going to be doing a good bit. Uh, but on a regular basis, you can find me on Twitter and, and most importantly, you can find me on thejournal.ie. Great. And thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. Um, you're one of our favorite audiences. And as you've probably heard me say multiple times on the podcast, if you can leave a review and rating, it's the best thing you can do to help support The Explainer. And also um, you can contribute to become a monthly contributor or supporter of the journal.e if you go to the journal.e forward slash contribute. Um, I think that is all I have to say. I'll get a thumbs up from my producer over here. It is. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We will have overnight coverage on Tuesday as well. <clears throat> and hopefully we will see you then. Thanks, Rana. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Larry.